Hello and welcome back, Practical Alchemist, back with season two in collaboration with Latinas Who Meditate. And today I have the pleasure of sitting with my sister, Catalina Novoa. She is a fellow Nike sign trainer and the founder and CEO of Babes of Wellness which is LA's first all-women's queer gym and Compton's first premier boutique studio. And so I'm so excited to dive into the conversation. Kat really focuses on fostering inclusivity for all bodies, journeys, and queers. And she has so many qualifications, I can't even begin to list them all, but some include being a trauma-informed practitioner, a certified PT and nutrition coach, a mindfulness coach, and so much more. Kat is just such a beacon of expertise, and I'm so honored to have you here today. Welcome, Kat. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an honor and a dream to be able to do this collaboration with you. So thank you. Of course, naturally, I had to wear my Nike today to represent. Let's see that. (laughs) So Kat and I initially connected because we went to Nike HQ together as one of the few selected trainers that had the opportunity to go and be onboarded in such a beautiful way. We got to get to know other trainers and practitioners and Kat and I just hit it off, connected, and I was like, we're straight up homies, you're my sister. And when I launched season two with Latinas Who Meditate, I know that your focus is a lot with wellness and fitness with your gym, but I know that also like you have such a deep, beautiful spiritual practice, your meditation practice. So I'm excited to talk about all the things. But first, we will begin by asking the question that I ask everybody to honor Hispanic Heritage Month, and that is, what are your raices? What are your roots? My roots, thank you for that question. My raices are from Mexico. So both of my parents are from a very, very like small towns in Michoacan, Mexico called Jiquilpan. The nearest biggest town is probably called Sawayo. So not a lot of people are familiar with it, but I love it there because it feels like when you go back, it's just like a big hug from like Mm. thousands of people, which can feel like a lot. But in retrospect to LA, Everybody knows you. You're everybody's prima, tia, abuel. It's just beautiful, and I love it. Oh, that's so wonderful. I know both my parents are also from really small towns in El Salvador, and I'm like, I it's if you know where it is, great. I don't expect you to. It's so <laughs> beautiful. And have you always been an athlete, or is fitness and wellness something that you found later in life, in your adult life? Yeah, so I grew up playing soccer, both for like parks like AYSO and also at school. So I started playing at the young age of six and I went all the way up to high school and then I dipped my toes into dance, although I felt like I didn't come into myself and feel really comfortable with my body until later on, like my mid 20s. But yeah, movement has always been a part of me. And when I stopped moving for such a long time, I felt trapped. I lost connection and touch with my body. And interestingly enough, also with myself, my spiritual practice. So for me, the two and two have always gone hand in hand. Wow. When was that point when you had a pause, a gap in your movement? Yeah. So I grew up Christian. And I think just from my personal experience, movement was never celebrated, especially as a female. We had to, we were told we could only move a certain way and it had to be in adoration to God. And I had to like cover up. And so I, there, there was a lot of restriction. So I felt almost trapped. And then just not fully submitting to the Christian ideologies was also very tough on like my mental health and just like my spiritual practice because I always felt conflicted. I felt guilted into believing something and then that also tied into my queer identity, right? So there is like a lot of internal turmoil happening all at the same time. And I was almost like fighting for my life in a sense. Yeah. Wow. I can imagine that the reclamation of your beingness was such a powerful point in your life. 
Yes, it was the most liberating thing ever. I've never felt so true to myself and I've never felt closer to God and Mm -hmm. source. Like before I couldn't even say the word God because it was such a trigger for me, but I've never felt closer to God than when I came out and when I accepted finally who I have been called to be here on this earth. And for some people, it may not be a big deal, but when you struggle with it for such a long time, then you make the space to truly be authentic. And when you can accept your authenticity, then you can show up different in your meditations, in your connection with other people and in your actual calling. Wow. That's so beautiful. It's like when you came home to yourself, that's when you were really able to tap into what source, what that connection meant to you. And I think that's for so many people that experience. It's like that connection is not outside of them. It's just within themselves. And then it feels and looks different for everybody. And that's what's so beautiful about it. Exactly. I feel like when you start truly exploring yourself and your triggers, there's almost like in the matrix where you have a mirror all around you. It's like a universal mirror that's constantly reflecting like, hey, these are the things that need to shift. These are the things that need to break. These are the things you need to unlearn. So you can truly look in the mirror and love what you see, your essence, it's beautiful. And all these external voices and forces that have told you're not good enough because of this, or this is incorrect about you now almost become muted. Mm. That's such a beautiful analogy. Thank you for that. And you established the first all women's queer gym in LA. Congratulations. I mean, that statement alone, you should be so freaking proud of yourself. I'm so freaking proud of you. What was the catalyst that sparked the creation of that space? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. It has been such a journey for me and I didn't really understand what I was doing probably up until this year to be quite honest, like when you, when the divine just calls you to take a step of faith and say, trust me, trust my guidance, trust where I'm taking you. Like you don't see the full vision, but she really does. And so for me, the catalyst for this was I have a background in apparel manufacturing, so fashion design, and it was very toxic. I lived in China for a really long time. It was just detrimental to my health. I know I have so many lives detrimental to my (laughs) out of all the times we've had deep dives and heart to hearts is my first I also lived in China for a summer but oh I enable this conversation for our next coffee date for our next breakfast that I still owe you okay I love it and so for me I was already starting to do a lot of advocacy work with different shelters that hosted survivors of violence around LA OC and East LA And they asked me, hey, you need to be trauma-informed certified in order to work with this population because there's any everything and anything can be a trigger for them. So we want to make sure that you have the knowledge and the certification to make sure that we can allow you to engage, even though you're not a licensed social worker or whatnot. And so that's what really started it. And it just opened my eyes because the theme of everything was feeling safe, helping survivors feel safe again in their bodies, in their connections with other humans. And when I thought about that, I said, okay, I'm trauma-informed, now what? And they asked me, well, what kind of workshops can you lead for free? And I said, well, I do fitness and I do meditation, mindfulness. I can share what I know and what I practice. That's it. So I did. And the feedback, the response that I got was like, oh, my God, this is the first time I've been able to close my eyes without shaking, without having a visceral reaction. Or this is the first time I allowed myself to cry without feeling like I need to clean up my tears because my child's going to see me. And so it was this element of feeling safe and trusting their bodies again after going through so much abuse And it just clicked for me. I said, once they leave this program, where are they going to go? They don't feel comfortable going to normal gyms, right? Where there's so much harassment from, unfortunately, like our male counterparts and that can just like re-trigger them. So it's not a safe place for them to go. And I said, gyms should 
cultivate this. This should be the atmosphere. And I said, well, I'm just going to start it myself. Let me just merge the two worlds together because historically speaking, for wellness, yoga has been seen as like the top pillar for wellness, right? And then on this side, you have like your strength training and conditioning, your CrossFit people, but they're two different worlds. They have been two different worlds. And so what I did seven years ago was say, hey, let's bring these two worlds together, the masculine and the feminine, because collectively when they collide, it shouldn't be like an atomic bomb, but it should be a beautiful experience, almost like emerging, like when the waves come crashing, it can seem hectic and chaotic, but there's a flow. There's this synergistic flow that's just so beautiful. And when we honor both parts of ourselves as individuals, I think that's where the magic happens. So a long-winded way of saying how Babes of Wellness came to be. I love that. That's so beautiful. And it's so beautiful that it started as this thing that you wanted to help people and you were just teaching what you knew. And then you saw, wait, there's actually a really big need here. And so why was it important for you that this was an all women's queer gym? So when I first originally started, I think because 99% of the survivors at the shelters that I was working with were women or female identifying, I said, I want them to come into a space where they feel safe. And safety was always my top priority. Like before I wouldn't even disclose where I was, I was very hush about it because of their safety. Like legally, I could not disclose of it. And so then it just evolved. There's gyms have always been for men. They've always catered to the men. And so what if we started creating these spaces for black and brown and queer people to feel safe? Like it, it's not just like they're an added addition, like you're welcome to, but this was designed for you and by someone like you with so much intention and love. That's so beautiful because I find that a lot of the times the barrier of entry for BIPOC folks or queer folks isn't necessarily the accessibility. It's more so the invitation and feeling welcomed and feeling a sense of belonging and feeling safe. Like you said, I think safety is such a big piece, especially because movement is such an intimate thing. Oh, yes. I have also seen, I think, given my background, that our bodies hold so much emotion. Our bodies are just the vessel. And when you cater to a population and a group of people that historically have had a terrible relationship or a toxic relationship with themselves, with their bodies, with food, and have had inequality, even in terms of like access to whole foods, right? And different wellness centers, of course, there's going to be a lot that can be stirred up for them energetically and emotionally. And as someone that's not an, a license, I had to be very gentle with how and when I did it and making sure that I created the container for them to feel like they can explore that on their own. And so, yes, safety has always been like the number one thing, making them feel like, hey, this is a wellness sanctuary. And that's always been part of our mantra. I want this to feel like a sanctuary. When you walk into sometimes beautiful like Catholic churches, just the art and the essence and like the energy, there's so much reverence to it, right? And Gym should have a reverence, an energetic reverence in the space. When people walk in, they feel like I don't have to put my walls up and show that I'm this or my ego kick in or I have to put walls up because I don't want my inner niña to come out, the one that was abused, the one that was shamed for how her body looked or what she was eating. But I can just take a breath, a deep breath breath, a belly breath that feels expansive, that allows me to heal my relationship with my body. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. And I'm curious because I know that you're such an advocate. You're so passionate about equality and inclusivity. How do you see queer representation in the wellness space from your experience? Oh, almost non-existent. It's changing now. I definitely see it shifting. But even as someone 
like in my own personal journey, I didn't come out until like after I opened the brick and mortar. I was still in the shadows. But if I was requiring and asking of my members, hey, I need you to show up authentically because that's going to give you the best outcome here in your journey. I can't ask them what I'm not giving them. And so it not forced me to come out in a sense, but it, it called me gently and said, hey, you're asking for authenticity. So I need you to be authentic. Mm-hmm. And in also now being a leader, right, and having employees, I am very intentional about hiring a big portion of my staff is queer, like 90% of us are queer. And that's super important. But it's also been super challenging and difficult to navigate because there aren't a lot of queer fitness trainers or yoga instructors or practitioners in the space. And it's challenging because we want to cater to a community to show them, hey, we're here to represent you, to speak on your behalf, to show you like we exist, we're here right? But we need more queers in the space. Absolutely. Like we need more leaders. We need more sound healers because I think it's important. It just hits different when you can mirror that back for someone and say, hey, your experience is validated. And since coming out, I've had so many people come to the studio and say, your story inspired me. Like I now feel safe to be myself. And this is coming from 15 year olds or 18 year olds Mm -hmm. or 40 year old woman that is still unsure of her journey. And just being able to tell them like, we're here for you. We're here. We see you. We love you. And we created this space for you. Wow. And that's why representation is so important, isn't it? Because it's hard to feel seen in a space when those around you don't look like you or maybe have this the same orientations as you or what have you and you feel isolated what do you think are some of the barriers for of entry in the wellness space I think one, it's like your identity as you present, if you present more mask or more feminine, it is a very male dominated space. So there's tends to be like, if you do CrossFit, you look a certain way, you're mm-hmm. probably gay. It, people make these assumptions. If you're like a yogi, you're definitely more hyper femme in your femininity. So you're obviously not gay, but like there the queerness is a spectrum. I always tell people there's no right or wrong way to look or present as queer. If that's how you identify, then that's who you are and that's okay. And so the barrier of entry, I think, is helping people, like people who are non-queer, like our allies, helping them understand, hey, don't make assumptions, right? One thing that we do in our studio is we always introduce ourselves, our pronouns. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if they feel comfortable, I say just your identity, because being able to stand in your truth and say, this is who I am, like the two words I am is so powerful. But when you shy away from that, you're like, why do I have to identify as such? It's a statement. It's you saying, I accept who I am. Mm -hmm. I own every part of who I am, no matter how challenging it's been. And I'm willing to be seen as I am Mm and not having to portray or show up as how other people expect me to be, right? For example, I call myself like the in-between because I can be very masculine. I have had to live in my masculinity a lot in order to survive like the trauma that I've been through. But now I can let my hair down. I can wear my hoops. I can wear makeup and still feel both. Mm -hmm. And that's valid. And that's okay. It's validating myself when I make the statement, I am this, I am lesbian, I am queer, I am whatever that is for other people. I think what you said is so key. It's for queer folks to feel that empowerment and that I am statement and also for allies. It's almost like it's our responsibility to engage in this great unlearning of the way that we assume because you present a certain way, you must be X, Y, or Z, right? And creating a container where people can express and emote authentically as themselves without being automatically categorized as something or someone. Right, exactly. And I think 
it's also so true because there's so much homophobia in the Latino culture. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's still super prevalent. People think, oh, we're in 2023. Times have changed. But look at the laws that are being passed, the things that are being overturned and not to get too political, but this is still our everyday struggle. So just teaching people and creating the container for people to have the space to stand up proudly and say, this is who I am. I'm Latina. I'm Latina. I'm queer. I'm straight. I'm this. And just having them own their full identity, their full authentic self is powerful in and of itself. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> and on the note of you're doing really incredible work for the community, for the collective, and clearly it's being recognized. And I'm so happy that we get to be in this Nike Well Collective fam together. I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to hear about your journey of how you initially connected with Nike and how that came about. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited. I'm so happy I get to do this with you. It's so special. Just being able to, again, have so much representation with an iconic brand such as Nike. For me, it's always been like my dream, obviously, being in the space. Like other brands just have not made the cup for me. And from doing like vision board photo shoots to say, I can see myself doing this, I'm going to do this, to just releasing that intention. And when I am ready and when the time is right, it will happen. So, I didn't have to chase. I attracted, as so many of us know, to do, right? We know that's like a staple. That's what you must do. And I think just doing the work and showing up and being consistent, being authentic to my voice, myself, and my business, they reached out to me via email and decided to come. They reached out to me actually through my app that I had and someone sent me a message and then I saw the email that said like at nike.com I like I choked almost and I was like keep my cool don't act overly excited just be chill be chill cat and so then one of them ended up coming to the studio taking one of the classes we had a whole conversation but prior to that actually we had the Nike partnered event with a different agency my friend's agency word agency and I ended up getting COVID. So I didn't even get to meet the Nike people because I tested positive like the morning of. And it was still when we were testing before events, having like testing on site. So I was so bummed. I felt like I had missed out on my opportunity. Like it's just not meant to be. Oh my God. And later on, once obviously I felt better, met up with them and they brought the whole North America team to come and meet with me and the team loved us. We got to share about who we were, what we were doing. And it was like marriage after that. <laughs> wow. That is the ultimate story of surrender, letting go, and divine timing. I cannot imagine the inner turmoil that you felt when you thought you missed your opportunity with Nike, you got COVID, you were sick, and that was it. And that was it. And it all happened. It was, and this is going back to our earlier conversation. I felt like I had to go underground. I was in the dark. It was during my dad's anniversary of his passing. And so it was already like a very triggering season for me. I was sick, ended up getting pneumonia. It was so many things. So I literally had to be pulled away from everything I knew, everyone I knew, go under, heal, do the internal work. When you're sick, like you have to face yourself. You're just with yourself. You have to be by yourself. You're isolated. So many other things going on in the business. And I just had to trust. I had to trust what's for me is going to be for me. I don't have to fight for it. I just have to surrender and know and believe that the divine has my best, 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 absolute best interest in mind. If it's mine, and that's it. That's it. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. And I want to put on your coach hat for a little bit because it would be doing the listener disservice if we didn't tap into your wisdom. And I know that you're the queen of optimization. Maybe it's because you're a Capricorn. Maybe it's your role as a coach. Maybe it's both. Are you a Capricorn or is your moon in Capricorn? No, your moon is Cancer. My moon is in Capricorn. Your moon's in Capricorn. Your sun is in Cancer. Yes. That's right. Maybe it's your Capricorn moon. 
What are some of the tools that you have implemented that have alchemized your life from a mental health perspective, from a fitness perspective? And we can cover the realm of physical nutrition. We can cover the realm of mental health, mindfulness. What have been some of your favorite tools that you also share with your clients? Yes. Number one, and I think it's the most underrated thing ever. And now it's getting highlighted and becoming trendy, but definitely sleep. We were not created to go 24 hours a day, move at the speed of social media. Like social media was designed after we were created thousands of years afterwards. And I think now there's always a sense of urgency and having to get things done and having to move. I always tell my clients, if you didn't sleep good, don't push, don't chug a pre-workout just for the sake of getting a workout. You are doing your body a disservice because sleep regulates your hormones. It regulates your stress. It regulates your appetite. It regulates your mood. If you are not having a consistent sleep schedule, I don't mean going to bed at 10 and waking up at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday comes, you're out till 5 a.m. partying and then you're super tired. No, try to go to bed and wake up at the same time every single day, at least within 30 to 45 minutes of the same time frame. That's one. You will instantly feel better Your energy levels will feel better. Your hormones will be much more regulated for those who have a cycle. And number two, now going on to the topic of cycle, is really working with my menstrual phase, right? It's the same thing as the lunar cycle. It goes through cycles. So do our bodies. If you are someone with a JJ, every single day, our hormone levels are different. They're ever-changing every single day. So if you feel like a different person every single day. You're not crazy. It's just your hormones doing what they do. So for example, your follicular phase, which is the first phase normally lasts like 10 to 14 days. That's when your energy levels start increasing right after your period. You feel like you wake up and you're a different person, right? So it's best to ease into a workout, maybe a slower type of strain training exercise, maybe even Pilates. Then you go into your ovulatory phase where your hormones like go up. And that's when you feel like you probably have the most energy. So runny, high intensity type of workouts are optimal for that time. And then normally last three to five days, one to three days, depending on the individual. And then we have our luteal phase, which we all know as our PMS phase right? When we're hormonal, we're moody, we're achy, we're crampy. That's the time to start slowing down. So maybe more gentle movement like yoga, walking, things like that would be most optimal. And then when you have your menstrual phase, it's almost like do nothing, just cocoon. Cocoon, listen to the downloads, listen to the insights, journal if you want to move. Everyone is different. Of course, sometimes During my menstrual phase, I have a lot of energy. So I always tell people, listen to your bodies, but also don't push it. During your menstrual phase, you might feel like I'm getting eight hours of sleep, but I still feel tired. You might need 10 during that time because your body is also dispersing of so many nutrients and just learning what to eat. So I always say, pay attention to where you're at in your cycle and don't beat yourself up. Don't try to push past what your body is naturally designed to do. I know I gave a lot. No, I I love it. I love it. I think it's so important because the cycle syncing piece has been such a game changer for me for folks who experience changes in their hormones every single day. You know, all of the research that has been done, and, and you know this better than anyone, all the research that has been done on fitness, on wellness, on muscle, muscular growth and mobility and all of that primarily has been done with our male counterparts. Why? Because they are easier to have control over changes in their bodies. Women have historically been cast aside when it comes to all the studies that have been done. Now Things are changing now, but all the research is primarily based on individuals who don't experience changes in their cycles and their hormones every month. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why the fitness industry has been so problematic because 
you have had a long line of male trainers telling women how to move their bodies and telling them just push past it, shut up and squat and that whole narrative that has been detrimental to our own health. And then psychologically, it just puts like a stressor and added load to us because then we feel incapable. We feel like we're not enough. We're not strong enough. We're not this enough. And we're not meant to push and to operate on a men's cycle. Men's cycle, they go through what we go through in 24 hours. Like they're like this, very, very neutral party, right? And even the work, the nine to five work schedule was based off of their cycle, not ours. So, you know, I think it was someone had shared like in France, they're moving towards like the three day work week. And I think that's brilliant. And now giving women time off during their menstrual cycle as it should be, because that's actually when we're receiving the most creative insight and downloads because we're meant to cocoon. We're meant to sit with ourselves. There is so much power during our menstrual cycles. But again, it's been demonized as something that's supposed to be painful and yucky and disgusting and not to be talked about, but we should because that's our power. It is our divine power. Mm -hmm. Truly, truly, truly. And it's also the way in which women and and folks who who identify as women, but also folks specifically who experience menstrual cycles, it's actually detrimental to move a certain way and nourish a certain way based on your cycle. And so many of the the diseases that we see, the chronic conditions that we see that are hormone-based can actually be really supported by living a lifestyle that supports the menstrual cycle and supporting our hormones and not doing something that's going to spike up our cortisol when we're already in that time of the month where we're so sensitive to hormone imbalances. Yes. And one just, I think I always like to give people like the low hanging fruit, something that they will remember. And something that I always tell my babes is, hey, when you are on your menstrual cycle, or you're about to get it, reduce your caffeine intake, because that's just you telling your body's trying to tell you, hey, let me just slow down. And you're like, I'm so tired. I just need a second cup or a third cup of coffee. Like that is not what to do because that spikes up your cortisol levels. And also you get the menstrual extra bowel movements, if you will. And we think, oh, it's because of what I ate. It's because of this. And you start like this negative narrative within yourself, this negative dialogue, but it's really just what you're consuming. Your body is not meant to have caffeine during your menstrual cycle. It's actually detrimental. And so you, and also like Steven, I understand sometimes it becomes really painful, but I always tell people your cycle, what happens during your cycle is actually a reflection of how you moved and how you ate the 25 days prior to that. Well, it's just a reflection of that. So if you want to change the next cycles, the next upcoming cycles, change what you're doing leading up to that. Because if you're resting, if you're eating a balanced, nutritious diet, then your hormones will automatically know how to regulate. Our bodies are so incredibly intelligent and articulate. And if we give it the right tools, it will do the rest for us. Mm, That is so true that the body knows how to regulate itself. We just need to create an environment where it can feel supported to do so. Exactly. The biggest swap I tell my babes is switch out the coffee for te de cilantro, so Mm -hmm. cilantro tea, because it helps. Cilantro tea. Yes. So cilantro has been studied to be very potent to help flush out the surge of progesterone and estrogen that we get. And that's what causes like the menstrual acne and pimples and stuff like that, or like the bloating, the extra gas that we get. So if you're experiencing any of those symptoms during your luteal phase, either eat cilantro or just make a tea of cilantro. And there you go. Wow. I'm definitely going to try that one. And how does one make tea of cilantro. So you can buy the packets. Not a lot of stores have it. I've seen it at like Sprouts and Whole Foods, 
Or you can just make it yourself, just allow it to dry out and then you steam it and you add hot water just like you normally would. You can make your own tea bags. I know there's a lot of DIYers that probably listen to your podcast. It's simple and you can infuse it with mint as well if you want a more like uplifting Mm -hmm. type of taste. I think I'm going to try that today, even though I'm not in my my molecular phase, but I'm like, I can always use a flush of extra what are the hormones that we have an excess of during the menopause? it's progesterone and estrogen yes and those are the culprits for the feeling sluggish the bloating the acne and so if we can flush those out i'm gonna go make this tea after this thank you for that tip (laughs) of course even if you just eat it but when it's diluted a bit in like warm water your body absorbs the nutrients a lot quicker So even if you just eat it, if you're like, I don't want to say lazy, but if you're not in the mood for making tea, now we're getting a little bit into colder weather. So it might be more appetizing for some folks, but yeah, swap it out for the coffee and just let your body rest. Let your body do what it needs to do. Don't push past it. Even having meetings, right? Like during your menstrual phase, I know sometimes we have deadlines. If you start, it's not always practical for most people, but there are certain things that you can control, right? Maybe you see at the end of the month, don't book all those extra meetings. Normally, you know you can and you're that baddie and you can do it. But during that time, give yourself space, Mm -hmm. space to be. I'm really learning that. I'm really learning at looking ahead at my calendar and being able to guesstimate when I'm going to be in that period of my cycle where I'm like, I'm doing nothing unless it's like super urgent, canceling everything. Right. Because then you just feel like overwhelmed. You already know naturally you're going to feel super overwhelmed, stressed out. You're just not going to be in your in the best mood possible. So like your body's asking you to show up for it versus showing up for everybody else. Mm. And that's just part. It's seasons and it's okay. It only lasts a few days. The world will still be there after seven to 10 days. Like you're fine. Nothing's going to happen. You're fine. 100%. And arguably it'll be better because you'll be able to really be in a headspace to deal with everything and strategize and execute, et cetera. Yes, exactly. I'm not, I know I learned this from the Bible, but in ancient times, women used to be sent off and sent away. They couldn't communicate with society. And although I'm not for that, because it was more like a shame tactic, like, ill, you're disgusting, gross, get away. I think it's super helpful for us to simply just cocoon and not give to the world, just give to ourselves. Because yes, you do come back better, but you don't do it with that intention. You just do it because you deserve rest. Absolutely. You deserve to to that process. And I'm always one that questions everything. And I think it's like, if we think about the narrative through which a lot of ancient texts have been written, it was through the narrative of men. And so who actually knows what was happening at the Red Tents? Maybe it was super sacred. And maybe it was super magical and these women were dropping in and entering altered states of consciousness because they were all gathered during a super intuitive time. Who knows? But maybe that's a topic for another episode. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for all your wisdom, your energy. I just freaking love you. And I know the listeners will too. So how can people connect with you? How can people find you? Yeah, of course. So my personal app is just IG and threads. If people still use that. Super Novoa. So add an extra O in between the V and the A at the ending. And then Babes of Wellness everywhere. Yay. Well, if you're in LA, definitely go check out Babes of Wellness. And Kat, thank you so much for just being you and for doing all the amazing work that you do. Love you. You love you.